Hello, so my name is Hugh Trenchard. I'm going to give a presentation on Peloton models. This is a presentation for Emile de Rosnay's Tour de France course in July 2022. So a little bit about myself. I have been a competitive cyclist. Uh, I was uh, category one, which I believe is the highest of the amateur ranks before one goes into professional ranks. Um, had mediocre results, uh, you know, the odd top five result in sort of provincial level, um, nothing particularly stellar, but it has allowed me to have some insight into the dynamics of pelotons and to understand bicycle racing and uh, to be able to um, give me enough insight to be able to, to actually prepare a model of, of peloton behavior. And so it's this that uh, I'm going to be presenting in amongst uh, other models, of course. Um, in terms of my own sort of qualifications, I'm not a physicist, and uh, I think there was a, a writer for a, an article in the United Kingdom who referred to me as a self-taught physicist, but uh, I, I don't think that that's accurate. We shouldn't go that far. Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, maybe let's just leave it at that. I think with that caveat, I'll uh, just uh, continue on. I can switch the page. So what is a Peloton? I think it's important to start with a, a working definition. So we have these uh, more colloquial definitions of Peloton from the French meaning the pack or uh, the main group. Uh, but I think we, we would be served well to have a more formal definition. So we could think of Pelotons as groups of cyclists that are coupled by the benefits of drafting. Um, so they interact with each other um, and largely due to um, the uh, benefits of drafting when one rides behind another. But we can even get a bit more precise. And we can say that their peloton consists of two or more cyclists riding in sufficiently close proximity to be located either in one of two basic positions, either in the drafting position or the non-drafting position. And then we can generalize this to larger groups of cyclists. Um, so, but it raises the question uh, in terms of these other definitions that we have for, about the pack, about the main group. Look at this image here. Is this whole thing a peloton or are each of these individual groups pelotons? What about this little group here of five or four? Well, it meets the definition that we're working with. These individual riders here who are off the back of these groups that probably not within drafting range, they're not part of the peloton according to this definition. So that's what we're gonna work with here and I'll leave it to, um, you can debate with Emil whether uh, that's uh, an accurate uh, description of a peloton or not. So I'm gonna look at three different models here, mathematical models, agent-based models, game theory models of pelotons. So the first one I'm gonna get into, this is a mathematical model. This is Olds' model from 1998, the mathematics of breaking away and chasing and cycling. So I would argue that Olds was probably the first uh, researcher to look at collective behavior of pelotons. So they were precursors to Olds who looked at drafting quantities of one rider behind another. And you know those are two cyclists and therefore that meets the definition of peloton that we're working with. Um, but they didn't really model collective behavior as such. And so Olds is really the first to come along and, and look at uh, Peloton as a whole and the dynamics of the Peloton and to model the behavior of uh, Pelotons. So what he does is he, um, without getting into details, he applies a bunch of factors so he looks at sort of the power output factors to overcome the resistance uh, to generate speed. So really the resistance or rolling resistance, other, other kinds of smaller uh, types of resistances and uh, drag air resistance is the main one, of course, that we're looking at. And so drafting, of course, reduces that air resistance. So you ride in a zone of reduced, reduced air resistance and so he sort of lumps all these factors together, and then he uh, comes up with an, an algorithm uh, for determining the mean power of each of the different groups based on the number of cyclists within each group, and then uh, is able to make predictions about how long each group will either stay away or 
be caught by the following group of chasers and how much lead time each, each needs. So his key findings are that the mean group speed, so you have to you break away in your chasers, increases rapidly as a function of group size up to five or six riders. And this, this actually flattens up to, up to about 20 cyclists. Now he doesn't consider the effect of much longer races. He, he's looking at uh, this one of the sort of control variables that he uh, looks at for his experimentation procedure is uh, that there's 20 kilometers remaining left in the race. So I think if you were to consider a much longer distance, then you might say, well, actually, the, you do need 20, 20 cyclists and more is probably uh, allows for a longer uh, main, maintenance or sustaining the speed for longer periods of time. Um, and, but he doesn't consider that. But nonetheless, uh, that's a model for somebody else. So he looks at the required lead time for a breakaway, uh, for a breakaway group falls as the number in the breakaway group increases up to about 10 riders. So, um, and it flattens as the number of riders in the breakaway group approaches the number of riders in the chasing group. So, um, so if you have uh, you know, 10, 10 riders in your breakaway group, well, then you, you don't need um, a whole lot of lead time. And, and if, you, if you're, if there's 10 riders in the front group and 10 riders in the chasing group, well, then um, you don't need much lead time at all. That's basically what, what he's saying with his model. He's uh, demonstrating this as a conclusion based on his model, the equations that he's applied. And similarly, he said that if the chase group size is less than the size of the breakaway group, so that's, you know, you have five in your chase group and 10 in your breakaway group, and the wheel spacing among the chasers is greater than three meters, the chasing group will never catch the lead group. Now that um, is a bit of an artificial scenario because you don't generally get circumstances in which there's that much spacing in a between riders in a chase group, but nonetheless, um, he's able to come to this conclusion based on his model. And that's interesting, even if it is somewhat artificial, but there you might find circumstances where it will apply, such as uphills or even downhills, or maybe um, in temporarily in certain circumstances after, after there's been um, an in, a rapid increase in, in speed and then a, a deceleration. So there might be circumstances where it applies, but nonetheless, it, this is, these are conclusions that you can derive based on your model. And this is one of the powers of, of developing uh, any kind of a model. And in this case, a mathematical model, because it allows you to make predictions and allows you to come to conclusions about things that uh, you may not have known. And in many cases, we, we can see that as cyclists, that a lot of the conclusions that these researchers come to are obvious. Um, but nonetheless, the fact that a model can be created based on certain input factors or parameters, the, and, and it matches what happens in reality. This tells us that the factors that have been considered are principles or they are accurate in terms of their application to uh, the behavior that you observe. And that's important because it allows you to make predictions, but it also allows you to understand what's actually um, happening what in terms of the behavior that you observe. So then you've got this uh, Gall Thompson Griffiths mathematical model. Uh, this is 2018, so it's relatively new, but I, I would suggest that really what they've done here is it's a variation on the old model because they've done essentially the same thing by considering uh, sort of the power parameters. But in this case, rather than power, they use force. So it's a different set of equations. So it's a different model, even though it's capturing similar behavior. And they focus in on a single rider breaking away and consider the fatigue again, uh, or they, they consider the pedal forces required to over, overcome resistance on both flat and undulating courses. And then similar to the old model, they consider fatigue, but they use a different kind of uh, measure of fatigue. They look at potassium ions and the reduction in the capacity of muscles to, to contract um, based on 
sort of changes in the, in the concentration of potassium ions. So this is interesting because it's, it's essentially looking at behavior, again, that all cyclists are well aware of, but it's using different equations. So it is a different model. And what they look at and what the, one of the main conclusions they come to is that it's best to break away on a hill when drag reduction in the peloton is less significant so that the force differential is smaller between the breakaway and the peloton. So when you're riding inside a peloton uh, on a flat, then because you're drafting, you, the force required to turn the pedals over is quite a bit less than anyone at the front and quite a bit less than somebody riding on their own. But if you're on a hill, then you don't have the drafting advantage if you're inside the peloton. So your power output is essentially the same as somebody at the front. And that means that if you break away, there's actually smaller power differential between you and the peloton. And this is what Gall et al. models using their equations. So it seems to be obvious and it's confirmed by Scalas et al. in their paper who examined actual race results uh, and, and uh, concluded that the most successful attack attempts were made on hills. So, and again, this is, seems to be obvious for anybody who's done any bike racing, but Gall et al. have prepared a mathematical model to show this. And it also then allows you within the parameters of the model to make adjustments. So you can have control factors that allow you to uh, make predictions about uh, in different uh, inputs. So if you went sort of, you know, at what, maybe you can make a prediction about the gradient of the hill that's required to break away. Uh, and because of the uh, minimization of the drafting effect on, you know, certain different gradients, that sort of thing. So these models have predictive power. So and then I'm going to look at the Wolf and Saupe model, another mathematical model, and this is relatively new as well, 2017. So here they model the cooperation between two cyclists trading off between leading and drafting positions. So again, now consider whether uh, these two cyclists comprise a peloton or not. If they don't, well, uh, we still need sort of uh, uh, to be able to use two cyclists as a minimum unit of analysis for peloton behavior. We can compare it with solo riders, but the behavior of a peloton is necessarily at least two cyclists. And so I just leave that as sort of, a, you know, asking this question again, what is a peloton here? two or more cyclists uh, in my or in my co-author's definition um, actually is relevant to other models that we see. So in this uh, model, Wolf and Salpe, they use this um, optimization algorithm. So I'm not an expert by any stretch in optimization algorithms, but essentially, as I understand it, what happens with a, an optimization algorithm is there's a number of parameters that are considered and essentially they are run through the computer through using the computational power of the computer to iterate uh, in rapid fashion through a whole bunch of computations or calculations that converge on the best outcome for the input factors that you give it. So, the fact that you're using the, the computer power to generate these optimal, these best outcomes using probably millions, I'm not totally sure, of uh, iterations of, of these uh, equations to arrive at best outcomes. And that, that's a, a, a fundamental, powerful element of computational algorithms like this, optimization algorithms. And so Wolf and Salpe then uh, show with their results that 10%, that there is a 10% improvement in times if two equal riders, uh, equal riders in strength, share positions can, compared to a solo rider on the same course of five kilometers. So Wolf and Salpe also consider 
differences in fatigue rates and the effect of these differences on the optimal frequency of changing or trading off your position between the front non-drafting position and the drafting position. They show that higher speeds require more frequent positional rotation. And again, this is something that's actually obvious to cyclists that uh, is the faster you go, the faster you need to be able to trade off your positions if you're in a breakaway attempt. Um, but this is interesting because again, they rely on the equations to model this behavior and it is reflected in reality. So just looking at this, uh, one of their figures on the right here, essentially uh, what they've done, they apply what they call a penalty factor and they introduce it into their algorithm. But really what they're doing is they're saying, okay, well, at a slower speed, um, your trade-off times can be much longer. So you can take a pull, cyclists refer to riding the front as pulling. Um, you can take your pull for a much longer duration at slower speeds. And the faster you go through these different examples, the, um, the greater the, the differential is between your fatigue rate and, at, at the front and the fatigue rate of the falling rider is. So it's a bit like when you're going really slow, there's hardly any drafting effect. So it's as if you're both going uh, putting the same amount. So the, the rider behind you is not benefiting and is exerting the same energy expenditure or, or put, putting out the same power as you at the front. And so there's no differential in fatigue rates at really slow speeds. And so you can extrapolate that to you know, incrementally increasing your speed. And that means that the differential then between you becomes greater because there's a greater drafting benefit by running behind then and the person in front begins to fatigue much faster relative to you in, in a drafting position. So they show by their model that you it's optimal to trade off and to the idea is that you end up, uh, you know, e with equal sort of um, capacity by the end of this 5K race in this case. But it has really good application to pursuit races on the track. So a four kilometer pursuit with four riders. And you can see that, that in, in a pursuit race that they're going 60 kilometers per hour. So there's a really large differential between the output of the front rider and all the falling riders. So they need to trade off very rapidly. And you see this on in pursuit races. Uh, there's really just a few seconds where they take a pole before they go up the track and drop in behind. And this is necessary uh, in order for all the riders to be able to finish, cross the finish line at the same time. And this is exactly what they model here, even though they refer to it in the context of road cycling strategies, but it actually has really good application to something like pursuit racing or to a time trialing or that sort of thing. So now I'm going to talk about agent-based models. These are computer models that allow for any number of independent agents with assigned attributes to interact according to programmed rules of behavior. So, each an agent is um, a component of the system that has properties assigned to it, and it has rules of behavior. And the power of an agent-based model is that you can create any number of agents that you want and throw them all together to interact with each other according to the rules that you programmed with them with. And you can observe the collective behavior that emerges as a result of these interactions of all your agents. So it's a very powerful method of simulating collective behavior because I mean, you could have a thousand cyclists if you wanted, you could have 10 cyclists or you could have different you know, cyclists with different properties. Uh, you could have 100 A cyclists and 100 B cyclists, and they're both different, and they interact, and you can run these through these agent-based models, and you can observe the collective behaviors that emerge from running all of these agents together. So this is different from a, a strictly mathematical model in which you generate you know, a numerical value as a result of 
inputting values into your equations. And it's something like an optimization algorithm, but the optimization algorithm, of course, has a different objective. Um, you might call an optimization algorithm an agent-based model as well, um, just because of the sheer computational power of what's going on there. But really what you're doing with an agent-based model is you're applying properties to individuals that you can replicate through any number of agents within the system that you want. So Huntington et al., uh, they developed in 2011, probably the first agent-based model. And um, theirs uh, was, the outputs were numerical values, but they were able to do exactly as I've said, they've applied properties to individual agents and then allow the agents to interact and thereby observe collective behaviors. So they assigned their cyclist agents with maximum power outputs over a given range and probability values by which these agents might cooperate by taking front positions or defecting by seeking drafting positions. So essentially they do much the same as these previous mathematical models have done in the sense that they apply sort of power output or force parameters and then they consider fatigue parameters and then they introduce a control state or parameter or variable. And in this case, in which the riders increase their speeds in order to break away. And they may do this according to a certain probability. Um, and there may be a probability by which cooperators um, spend time at the front and defectors spend a certain amount of uh, time in the back. And so these are all adjustable, but the what they've done uh, at all have performed a number of experiments using a set of parameters that they uh, considered to be um, ones that might result in behavior that simulates realistic behavior. And so they used a, a 160 kilometer flat race consisting of 15 teams and 10 riders. The results of their model show that weaker riders are better off defecting. Well, cooperation is a good strategy for stronger riders. And this, of course, is a realistic result compared with real world competitive cycling. And uh, again, it may seem obvious to cyclists that, uh, okay, of course, yeah, if you're a weak rider, you're gonna, you're gonna draft as much as possible. Um, but they model this. So that demonstrates the effectiveness of this kind of an agent-based model. And you, by doing this, they're identifying principles of behavior. So we come to an understanding better of the collective system. Then we move to a development of Radomero's Peloton simulation. And really, he, he takes Honigman's model. He then applies similarly uh, factors like uh, um, power up parameters, fatigue parameters. So, this, so the, these are standards now that we see kind of universal principles of Peloton modeling that we need these sort of uh, physical power parameters in which we're dealing with or addressing how to generate speed. And then we're looking at the human physiology about fatigue rates. So at certain speeds, how are you fatiguing? So he introduces these same parameters, but the big step that Radomero takes here is that he introduces flocking principles. These flocking principles were originated by Craig Reynolds back in 1987. And he uh, developed a model of bird flocks, essentially, that's what he was considering, but it has application to other systems. And looked at alignment and alignment parameters. So the agents align their uh, directions and a separation parameter in which they avoid colliding with each other and a general cohesion parameter. So the group, uh, there's a sort of a centroid towards which all of the agents within the group will gravitate. And there's an algorithm for that or an equation in which they um, you know, uh, gravitate in a centralized fashion towards this sort of centroid. And so then he, uh, as I said, he introduces these parameters 
um, and then comes up with a pictorial representation. And that's the next slide. So what he demonstrates is that cyclists tend to expend energy more efficiently by participating in well-organized lines in which cyclists advance toward the front, even though they might spend more time in non-drafting positions than some cyclists internal to the peloton. Really what he's saying here, and we can actually see it and I'll demonstrate it in a minute, but really what he's saying is that um, if there are, if you're inside the pack in what might be drafting positions, you there are instabilities within the peloton that move you into non-optimal drafting positions. And if you're consistently going into those non-optimal drafting positions, you could end up spending more energy or something close to the amount of energy that a front rider is spending. So really what he's saying, the conclusion that he's sort of uh, landing on is that what you need to do is to be in optimal drafting positions at all time in order for you to efficiently be sort of allocating your energy resources. And the, uh, this is, um, again, this is nothing new, but he's modeling that behavior. And one of the interesting things about this model is that he demonstrates the, um, an observation that I made in a paper and identified in a paper, which I call convection-like behavior. So really that's a, a system of heating, uh, say molecules within uh, you know, a, a liquid fluid or something like that uh, and cooling. And so you get these rotational patterns of heating and cooling molecules, or in this case, uh, cyclists. And this, this emerges as uh, behavior, collective behavior within his model that we don't actually necessarily predict. We're not able necessarily to predict that from the individual rules that apply to each cyclist or agent in and of themselves. And that's one of the powers of this kind of model as well. You can look at what are called emergent properties. This is, these are behaviors of the collective system as a whole, global behaviors that you could not or uh, were unlikely to be able to predict from looking at individual rules. And so you make these new observations. And in fact, in this case, it's an observation that has a realistic analog. We actually can see this kind of behavior occurring. So it's, it's a really powerful model in that respect. So then um, I, I'll send this um, PowerPoint presentation to Emil. And if you want to click on the links to actually look at uh, the simulations moving, then you can. But just in the interest of time, I'm going to move through this a bit more. Uh, the, the next sort of uh, incremental development, I'll say, um, is our model. Uh, in which uh, this is a 2015, again, agent-based model, and it uses this simulation platform called NetLogo. So essentially we take Radomero's dynamical model, but we introduce a different way of modeling the energetic relationships between the cyclist agents. So really what, what we do is we apply an equation that I developed, which I call the Peloton convergence ratio, which is really a ratio between the power output of the leading rider as attenuated or reduced by the drafting quantity and the maximal sustainable output of the drafting rider. Um, without getting into details of this equation, it becomes a powerful equation because it allows us to identify changes in or transitions in phases of behavior, collective behavior. So I talked about this convection behavior, which is really a phase of Peloton behavior. And we can identify, well, the convection behavior in and of itself isn't really accurately identifiable through this equation, but we can model behavior where there's the, the transition, or we can identify where there's a transition between a compact Peloton at lower speeds and a high speed stretched peloton. And looking here, this is uh, just, these are 14 cyclists and this is uh, basic based on 
um, a points race on the track of 14 riders. And this is a, this is a part of the race in which they, the 14 riders are stretched out and not in a more tight, compact position um, or configuration. And, and uh, the PCR equation allows us to capture this behavior and it allows us to identify where these transitions occur. So this equation also has power in the sense that it has application to other biological systems. So for example, um, and I know I'm getting close to uh, my half hour limit here, but um, indulge me if, if you will. Um, if we consider applying Peloton principles to other biological systems and consider um, how this might uh, have implications for evolutionary biology, we can look at trilobites, for example, the fossil record of trilobites that shows stretched behavior, stretching or the sort of single file lines of trilobites and ask the question, well, maybe they are stretching as a result of a similar power output uh, thresholds that, that forces them to move into optimal drafting positions by going into a single file line because they're now approaching their own maximal sustainable output. So they're traveling very quickly for, you know, for their capacities. Um, as trilobites, probably they're not going all that fast, but for their power outputs, they, they would be. Um, and then consider, well, if there's a threshold upon which they begin to divide into, into groups, and that threshold is modeled by this PCR, then we can ask the question, well, where, is there some kind of sorting behavior going on? If you had a thousand of these trilobites all together and they end up being pushed to their maximal sustainable outputs, uh, is there a sorting behavior going on such that the weaker ones who can keep up according by their capacity to draft, but if you go too fast, they can't keep up even by drafting, they get sorted out or spat off the back as we call it, um, shot out the back of the peloton. And if you have enough of these, well, then they form their own group. And this has implications for migratory patterns or evolutionary biology in the sense that you have one group of stronger trilobites, and we know that there's a correspondence between mass and power output, so that you have these stronger, bigger trilobites going off in their own little group, and you have these weaker ones going off in their own little group. And maybe they never come back together. Maybe there's some reason why they get separated permanently. And if that happens, then you have the potential for speciation to occur. You have the potential for these, this slower group to become permanently a group of smaller trilobites. And similarly, you get this kind of arms race where you get this sorting of groups occurring continually over thousands, millions of years. And then you end up with this massive size differential in species of trilobites. And that's exactly what this fossil record shows is that I mean, you have trilobites that are two feet long and you have trilobites that are a centimeter or something like that. I'm not sure of the exact sizes, but you have these massive differentials in sizes. And this, there's um, a hypothesis or there's an explanation based on Peloton theory for this size differential. And the same thing goes for something like fish schools or other system, biological systems in which there is, there, there is a, an energy saving mechanism. And uh, I, I met with some fish researchers on San Juan Island at one point, and they told me that it's not well understood why fish are of the sizes that they are and why there's some groups of fish are essentially all the same size or you know, there's not a, not a big difference in their sizes. Why is that? Um, and, and Peloton theory offers the same 
explanation I just gave for trilobite behavior as it would for some schools of fish. It has, there has to be an energy saving mechanism involved. Um, but that's an example of the power of this kind of modeling equation because it allows an application to be made to other systems. And, and it tells us something very interesting about peloton principles in and of themselves. So, I mean, you look at flocks of birds flying around, schools of fish and uh, fossil records of trilobites, and um, there are universal principles that are applicable across a variety of these different systems. And there's evolutionary principles that are uh, derivable from studying peloton behavior. So that to me is fundamentally interesting. So I'm gonna move on now to game theory models. So, um, and I'll be short with this one because there really is, as I have uh, found in my research, there's really one kind of uh, pioneer of game theory models. And there are, I think he's published a number of papers where Minyo has uh, co-authors as well. But I think Minyo is really a pioneer of uh, game theory models for pelotons. And um, so I've got the one paper identified here, and I think there's others that he has authored and co-authored, but again, um, you know, really we come to him for uh, uh, developing um, and pioneering game theories in terms of cycling strategies. So I think probably most of us are familiar with sort of this prisoner's dilemma, at least uh, sort of superficially, you have two uh, prisoners who um, have committed a crime, they are separated from each other, they're either going to confess uh, to having the crime or they're going to keep quiet. And they have to consider, based on the information that they have, whether or not um, it, there's a benefit to them to confess or to stay quiet. And there's payoffs that are considered um, when you model this behavior with these types of tables that we're looking at here. And this table um, is from Mino's paper below. And essentially, he's doing roughly a prisoner's dilemma type uh, table. And he's looking at uh, what are the payoffs? What are the benefits if in this two sprinter scenario um, decide that they're neither one are going to draft? There's uh, riding side by side, there's sort of the equality of benefit. And then if one is drafting and one is not drafting, then Obviously, the drafting cyclist is going to maintain a substantial benefit. And the zero, zero in this corner is something like a track stand. Uh, there's no benefit to either of them. And uh, they're, they're neither are drafting each other. And they're not foregoing draft. So it essentially tells us they're, they're in a track stand. I'm just going to close this window. Okay, so about that, getting sun in my eyes. Okay, so that's really, that summarizes the game theory model and uh, to the extent that there may be other ones, uh, students can't of course investigate that themselves. So that brings us to the end of the presentation in which I've looked at different models of Peloton behavior. Thank you.